Hi everyone, hope you're having a great week. This week I want to talk to you from Psalm 32 and I've entitled this message Becoming a Person Who is Blessed because that's what this psalm is all about. I want everybody who's listening to this message to have the joy of knowing the blessing of God. And this psalm tells you how you can receive it. There are four sections to this psalm that I want to talk to you about this week. The first one is why a Christian is blessed beyond anybody in this world and therefore why you should be thankful if you are a Christian and why if you're not a Christian you need to become one. Secondly I want to talk to you about the simplicity of becoming a blessed person. I'm going to tell you why it's not a complicated thing to receive the blessing of God. Many people think that walking in the blessing of God is unobtainable for them, but actually it's a lot simpler than you think. I'm gonna to explain to you why. Thirdly, I'm gonna to talk to you about the urgency of the call to seek God's blessing on your life. I'm gonna tell you why you need to make a decision about that today. You know, we're all prone to procrastinate and to put things off this isn't something that you can put off it's a it's a message in your inbox that's marked urgent that you need to attend to the fourth thing is i'm going to talk to you about the spiritual experience you'll have if you enter in to the blessing of god i'm excited to tell you about that because it's available and it's waiting for you and it's greater than you think so let's just begin with talking about why a Christian is so blessed. The answer to that is found at the start of the psalm. Let's have a look at verses 1 and 2 together. It says this, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. That there is speaking of a Christian, someone who's put their hope and their trust in Jesus Christ. We know that because the Apostle Paul, one of the first uh, well-known followers of Jesus, said this in Romans 8 verse 1. He said, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And again, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 21, for our sake, he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us so that in him we might be the righteousness of God. It's through faith in Jesus Christ that the judgment of God is lifted from us and we are made righteous in God's sight. So David in this psalm verses 1 and 2 he's describing that reality but I love how he lays out the blessedness of it. He says twice in those two verses that this person is blessed and to be blessed means to be divinely favored or it means to be supremely favored so this person that david's describing is supremely favored by the divine that's amazing isn't it supremely favored by the creator the maker the sustainer the savior the Lord, the judge of heaven and earth. This person, the Christian, has the favour of the Almighty. Why? Well, because, David says, their transgressions are forgiven. They can live in complete peace, knowing that the Lord is not holding a thing against them. There's no grudge, there's no bitterness, there's no vengeance in God's heart towards them. They're completely free. Every time they've gone against God's law in their lives, God has forgiven it. He remembers it no more. They're blessed because their sins are covered, David says. Now, of course, this is linked to forgiveness, but it adds depth to the reality of standing forgiven before God. The Christian is blessed because not only has God let their sins go, but he's actively covering them in Jesus Christ. In love, the blood of Jesus has covered every sin and continues to cover your sins if you're a Christian. What this tells us about God is that he's just, but he's also made a way to justify you. 
God, the true God, the God of the Bible, he doesn't turn a blind eye to sin. He has to punish sin. He can by no means acquit those who are guilty. But for the Christian, the judgment that their sin is deserving of has been taken by Jesus Christ. Jesus took the judgment so that you don't have to. And as your advocate, Jesus has you covered. Jesus has got your back. The Christian is blessed beyond everybody in the world because they no longer have deceit in their spirit, David says. You know, before I was a Christian, I, I thought I was a good guy. Uh, but truly, I had a deviled conscience and um, I had mixed motives. I'd find reasons to justify my sins and my deceit before people and before God. Now, as a Christian, I live with a clean conscience and I live with clean motives. That's the miracle of the new birth. That's the miracle of having a new spirit. It's literally the supreme divine favour of God that we get to possess the heart of God as Christians. It's more precious than any wealth in the world. And that's the reality for a genuine Christian. So we take all of this that David says in the first couple of verses of this psalm and we see how blessed the person is who has come to Jesus. They've got complete forgiveness of all of their sins. They've got the radical grace of their sins being covered by the judge of all creation. And they have the spirit of the almighty living in them. That is a person who's blessed beyond all. It's a person who will know peace and joy in their life and they'll know life for eternity. To someone who doesn't know the reality of God's favour, these things might seem far off. They might seem unobtainable. I've had people say to me, you know, I'm, I'm just too far gone to become a Christian. I'm too old to become a Christian or I think becoming a Christian is beyond me. It's not for people like me. So I just want to explain to you the simplicity of stepping into this blessing that I've just described to you. We see that in verses 3 to 5 of Psalm 32. Let's just read that together. It says, For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. You know, David is very honest here in this psalm. He describes a time where he was living in spiritual darkness. It impacts his physical being. He says, my bones wasted away. I groaned all day long. It felt for David like he was carrying a heavy weight around every day of his life. And he felt weak. He had no energy. He had no strength. He had little motivation to do anything. I wonder if you can relate to that at all. But then something changes. He confesses his sin before the Lord and he experiences the forgiveness of the Lord. And then he receives the Lord's blessings and he receives the Lord's joy, which we're going to come on to shortly. David's whole life and his countenance has been transformed by one single, simple act. What's he done? He's opened up before the Lord about the sin in his life. Now that requires moving from a place of pride to a place of humility. You see, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. David felt a heavy weight when he wasn't walking in humility, when he wasn't confessing his sin. It wasn't just physiological, it was spiritual. It was the hand of God's judgment weighing down upon him. For millions of people in the world, the only barrier between them moving from a life that's cursed to a life that's blessed is having the willingness to humble themselves and confess their sin before their creator. I want you to consider today whether you might be one of those people. I'm not assuming you are, 
that I'm asking you to consider and to examine yourself, to ask whether you are. What Paul said in Romans 12 verse 3 is a good instruction on how God wants you to think. Paul said this, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself or herself more highly than he or she ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. If I can put it simply in relation to this psalm, that would be to say that every one of us needs to be honest, that we're flawed sinners, and we need to take that posture before God all the time. Just like the man in the New Testament who beat his breast in the temple, crying out to be forgiven, who Jesus contrasted with the religious guy who thought he was doing well and just compared himself to others. Jesus said those who exalt themselves will be humbled. That was the religious guy. But those who humble themselves will be exalted. That was the guy who recognised and confessed that he was a sinner. There is nothing spiritual at all about pretending you don't have a sin issue or that you've conquered every sin. There's certainly nothing spiritual about your times of intercession being for God to sort everybody else's sin issues out. A lot of Christians pray like that. God is looking for everyone in his kingdom to walk in humility, that you might walk in his blessings. I want to lay out for you the threefold approach that David took to walk in humility and to experience God's blessing on his life because you need to be willing to do this too. It's very straightforward. First thing David did, and this is all laid out in the psalm, he acknowledged his sin before God. He stopped acting with willful ignorance. Whether you acknowledge your sin or not, it's there. And God knows it's there. He just wants you to acknowledge it's there too. God is looking for people who are realists, not pretenders. That's the first thing. Secondly, David chose not to cover his sin any longer. He stopped actively finding ways to conceal his sin. He rooted out anything in his life that would enable him to live a lie. We must do that too. Thirdly, he confessed his transgressions before the Lord. Now, this is verbal and it's plural. It's not to merely speak out um, that you agree with the doctrine or the, the theological truth that you're a sinner, but it's to verbally confess your actual, literal sins before the Lord. So it's not saying, Lord, I acknowledge we're all sinners and I want to forgive me. It's, Lord, I've been greedy with my money. Lord, I've been angry towards my wife. Lord, I've been selfish in my church. Lord, I've been irritable towards my husband. Lord, I've been unloving towards my children. Lord, I've stolen things. I've streamed things that I shouldn't stream. I've downloaded things I shouldn't download. Lord, I've defrauded. Lord, I've lusted after this person. Lord, I've fornicated with this person. Lord, I've acted with pride in this situation. Lord, I've walked with arrogance towards these people. Lord, I've avoided serving and I've expected to be served. That's what the Lord's looking for. David named his sin, sins. He named his transgressions, plural. We need to bring all of our sins into the light as much as possible, as soon as possible, and we need to name them. Then when David did those things, the Lord forgave him and he knew God's blessing upon his life. It's not hard. It's very simple. Acknowledge your sin. Stop covering your sin. Confess your sin. You know, that's what sets somebody apart who's in the kingdom of darkness from somebody who's in the kingdom of light. Just a willingness to be honest before God. Anyone at any point in their life can do it. It's a lie from the pit of hell that you're too old, that you're too far gone, that you've committed too many sins, that you're not 
uh, belonging to the right demographic to be a Christian. The offer of God's blessings is for all. It's for you and he wants you to have them. Now that's why David goes on to say what he does then in verse 6, which is this. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer a prayer to you, Lord, at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. He's saying you need to take this opportunity today. So many people live like they're guaranteed 70, 80, 90, 100 years. Do you know in the world, the two people die every single second. In the span of this message, 3,600 people will have died from when I started speaking to when I finished speaking. And each one will die and face the judgment of God. And they're not all old people, it's people of all ages. There is no second chance beyond the grave. Purgatory is a man-made concept. There is no working off of sin once we die. We die and we give an account. Or Jesus returns before we die and we give an account. Today is a day where the grace of God is available to you. Tomorrow isn't promised. The next hour isn't promised. So there's an urgency in David's heart for you here because his heart is God's heart. God says to you, look, the blessings of forgiveness and grace and new life is available, but you need to step into it now. Don't be complacent and assume it's gonna be there forever. It won't be. The rush of great waters in these couple of verses, they, they speak of the day of trouble. The one who cries out to the Lord with an openness about their sin will be protected by the Lord on the day of trouble when his judgment comes upon the earth. What a blessing it is to have that assurance of protection. And that conditional promise that we see in verse 6, that's the start of four other implications for the one who is quick to confess their sin before God. So let me briefly run through for you what David says in verses 7 to 11 about the spiritual experience of those who confess their sin. This is what he says in verse 7, that the Lord is their security. So for the one who confesses their sin, the Lord is their security. Now we've just touched on that in verse 6, but it's repeated here in a different form. The Lord will hide you. The Lord will preserve you in the day of trouble. The Lord will surround you with shouts of deliverance. Make no mistake, the world is under judgment. It's under judgment now, and it will face the judgment of Christ, which is coming in fullness. And that will be a bloody and a brutal affair. Jesus is coming as a man of war to take vengeance on all wickedness and on all lawlessness in the world. But for those who are honest with him about their state today, his judgment will pass over them on the day of the Lord. They're assured of his protection. He is their security. Verses eight and nine of this Psalm, we see the Lord is the counselor for the ones who confess their sin. The Lord speaks to David here and he says that throughout his life he's going to lead David in the way that David should go. And he instructs David in verse 9 to willingly follow his leadership and not be like a rebellious wild animal that fights back. But the promise here for David is the Lord's guidance. The promise for the one who confesses their sin is the Lord's guidance. They'll be able to hear the Lord's voice. We see throughout the scriptures a spiritual principle that those who do as the Lord requires receive help from the Lord to be holy and those who reject what the Lord requires receive help from the Lord to harden their hearts against him and therefore to incur his judgment what the Lord requires is very simple the humility to confess your sin and to seek him for help and his promise here is that he will indeed help you Whoever you are, wherever you've come from, he'll help you. In fact, he'll give you wisdom beyond the worldly wise. He'll give you spiritual wisdom. He'll give you wisdom that leads to life. He will literally be your full-time counsellor and teacher. 
in verse 10, we see for the ones who confess their sin, the Lord is the lover of their soul. David testifies that the wicked, those who conceal their sin, they suffer many sorrows, he says. But the person who trusts in the Lord to forgive their sin, they'll know his love in their life. It's a popular thing in the church and in the world today to coin the phrase that the love of God is unconditional. You'll hear that from evangelists, you'll hear it from bishops, from vicars, from pastors, you'll hear it in the most popular worship songs. You will not find that phrase anywhere in the scriptures. It's true that God has demonstrated love for all, for God so loved the world that he sent his son. So he's demonstrated love for all in sending Jesus to die for the sins of the world. But that's quite different from the Lord giving his love, giving his acceptance, giving his approval to mankind on an ongoing basis, regardless of how people choose to live. This Psalm tells us clearly that the love of the Lord is for those who trust him. And to trust him is to trust him with your sin. It's to believe he'll forgive and bless you if you come vulnerably and openly to confess it all before him. And for those who do, they know, they experience the ongoing love of God in their lives, the love which fills them, the love which gives them joy. For those who refuse to be honest before God, they are void of knowing his love and they experience his hand of judgment and many sorrows in this life. Not just a few sorrows, but many sorrows, according to David. We see in verse 11 that the one who confesses their sin before the Lord, they know the Lord is their source of joy and their source of gladness. The last spiritual blessing we see for the confessors of sin is that the Lord becomes joy and gladness for them. It's hard to think of anything more inappropriate than to walk into a church community and to experience a lack of joy and a lack of gladness among the people there. If we're walking in the light, we should all have joy and gladness more than this whole world. Being people who confess their sins doesn't mean that we need to walk around sullen faced it means that we confess our sins and as we do we experience the indwelling infilling of god's overwhelming love peace and joy as we receive this inner assurance of god's blessing over our lives a church that's full of sorrowful people who are always sorrowful is according to this psalm a church that has an issue of pride in its midst. A church where people are concealing sin and not being as open as they should be. They're sorrowful because they're turning up to do their spiritual disciplines, but they don't know the Lord's protection or his voice guiding them or his love filling them, according to this scripture. A church that's joyful in Christ is a church where people are open, where they're honest, and where they're vulnerable. The church isn't a peer-to-peer counselling group where we just get together to share our struggles for the sake of it and then we try harder without any real hope or solution. The church is a place where we confess with great hope, with real hope, with true assurance of deliverance, which has to result in joy, praise and worship to a God who has made a way for each one of us to be new. That is good news, hallelujah. Let's pray today and ask the Lord that he would ask for the Lord to speak to us about whatever we need to take away from this message for where we are in our situations. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this message today. We thank you, Father, for what you're teaching us through the Psalms. We see, Lord, the simplicity of just coming before you and confessing our wrongdoing, having a right perspective on ourselves, not thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought, but humbling ourselves 
and being real before you. And we do that, Lord, with eager expectation, eager hope that you will deliver us from our sins, that you will forgive our sins, that you will cover our sins, that you'll give us a new heart and you'll give us love, peace and joy. I pray for everybody listening to this, that that would be the reality of their lives. Lord, your desire is that none would perish, but we would all step into your blessings. I pray for anyone listening to this, Father, who is in a place of indecision. I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would bring them into a place of full conviction. To be real and honest before you and to seek Jesus for the forgiveness of their transgressions and their iniquities and to experience the eternal life of knowing you, God, and knowing Jesus Christ, your Son, who you've sent. I ask this in your precious name. Amen. God bless you. Hope that's been helpful. Have a great week. Thank you.